Thank you very much, Madam Chair, and thank you all for being here. It's certainly an honor for me to be here. It's a great pleasure. I was here a couple of months ago for some preliminary talks about a plan to find out what it would cost to make preschool education available for all the children in Bosnia-Herzegovina and to find out how that could be financed. And yesterday I had a great conversation with a, a national agency here in Sarajevo. They're called Innova, and they have a great plan, a very smart plan to find out how we can investigate that. Because as you know, the governance structure in Bosnia-Herzegovina is very complex. And I really hope that my presentation, it could be another step in that process, and certainly the pre previous presentations have been very conducive to that as well. So please see my, my presentation as a step in, in, in that process of bringing more clarity into you know, the, the possible strategic options that you have in, in Bosnia and Herzegovina. Here's a little overview of the presentation. I start with a, a snapshot of education quality in your country on the basis of some of the indi uh, indicators, and then a, st a tool for strategy development. Mm, the question to me was, can you develop a few scenarios, a few options, a few different possibilities of such an expansion process? So what I came up with is I developed a tool and it, an instrument. Basically, it's just a figure with lots of colors, one slide, and that should depict possible patterns of enrollment of children in that age group over certain uh, programs. Um, in fact, there are four program modalities, so I'll explain them step by step, and I come back to that tool, that figure, to show you various possibilities. It is, it's really a tool that doesn't prove anything, um, uh, but it shows you the possibilities that should provoke strategic discussion about the future of preschool education in, in your country. Then, four strategies to finance the scale-up of that process. And by the way, it's a coincidence that it's four. It's not the case that there's one modality for one scenario and one strategy. So that's a coincidence. Um, unless you don't believe in coincidence, right? And then finally, some slides about... Uh, the funding process more, more in particular. So a snapshot of education quality in Bosnia-Herzegovina, as you know, pre-primary enrollment is very low, 6% according to national data, more according to the so-called Transmoni data uh, from the regional office of UNICEF. The difference is probably explained by the fact that if you look at the whole age range from zero to six, then you get a very low figure, but if you zoom in on the three, four and five year olds, you get a slightly better figure. Um, the rollout of the pre-primary year, you know, that preparatory year before children go to primary education, is stagnant, so that's a problem. The primary gross enrollment ratio is not universal. Now, in some countries you will find 100%, sometimes 99%, and that's not necessarily a problem. It could be an artifact of the system or the, the statistics, but at 96% you really have exclusion. And those 4% kids that are not in school are uh, probably concentrated in some of the disadvantaged groups, probably the Roma. And in that group, the participation rate may, may be even lower, so there's a problem. Secondary education, not very high, but more importantly, low performance at secondary level in the math, mathematics and science study, the international study. And that is really perhaps more important. There are countries in the regions in this region, for instance, Armenia, where you see that there's hardly any dropout, no, no repetition rates, everybody proceeds to second education. But then if you measure what children really learn, it's very disappointing, right? So this is really very important. I did not find very clear data on, on education spending, probably again has to do with the, the difficult uh, uh, structure, the governance structure, and the way statistics are being consolidated. But I did find that health indicators, both on the outcomes, you know, the way children are, their, their child mortality, uh, life expectancy, nutrition, and spending on health are actually not that bad, comparing Bosnia with other countries in the region. So, uh, that's good news. This is the scenario tool. Um, there's a lot of colors, maybe it's dazzling to you, but I'll explain it. Vertically, you see the age of children. It goes down from zero, one, two, three, four, five. I should have actually also had the age of the, the period of pregnancy, actually. And then horizontally, you see the social spectrum. The people, the children with the highest socioeconomic status, 
to the left hand side and the poor and more disadvantaged children to the left to the right hand side and then you see colors uh, you see yellow red shades of green and you see unicef blue uh, these are programs and the figure shows how children can be it's not the way they are it's not the way they should be but how they could be distributed over those programs some some places are empty so there's no children there uh, they're not enrolled but this is how the the preschool provision could look like in say five or ten years from now in Bosnia Herzegovina to explain it and how it works I first start talking about those four program modalities and then I come back to this slide and show you a couple of variations on the slides, show you how different patterns are possible, without saying that one is better than the other. So the kindergarten, we talked about it already. Deepa already said it's too expensive to show it up. And even in the West, as people sometimes say it, uh, you don't see so many countries with centralized universal systems. It's really Belgium, France, Italy, uh, Italy, perhaps the best system in the world in Bologna, uh, uh, you know, the, the region of Emilia-Romana. Uh, Emilia uh, excellent system, really. And in Spain, almost universal, Jardin Infantil. And you also see very high enrollment, but in, in diversified systems in, in Scandinavia. By the way, a little sidespec, sidestep. It could be interesting to also look at Scandinavia. It doesn't show in the statistics because it's diversified, so the enrollment ratio is not that high, but every child is really enrolled, sometimes in even home-based systems at, of very high quality. So it's more diverse. And if you think of the cultural differences between Scandinavia and the Latin countries, you also see that there is a difference in political culture between the countries, the way the, the country is managed, the way people interact. And that translates, apparently, in different uh, systems, unified versus diversified. And then there's the Anglo-Saxon paradigm, there is the East European paradigm, the Latin American paradigm. So it's, it's really good to see this in, in terms of paradigms and it would be a very good start for Bosnia-Herzegovina to say, okay, where do we stand? Are we a Latin country? Are we Scandinavian? Do we like Anglo-Saxon? This is really where it starts and then you develop your system further. Um, the, the kindergarten system um, Excuse me. It basically functioned as a as a private system. It caters in, in in other countries. It you see that private systems are the ones that cater for the rich and the famous and the two job families. But in East Europe, including Bosnia Herzegovina, uh, and again it was a slide of Deepa to show that it was really for the better the higher uh, wealth quintiles. Yet the fee is too low to substantially mitigate government spending but high enough to keep the poorest groups away. I'll explain this. And this makes me even a little bit angry every time I talk about it, because why do you have a fee? A fee is introduced because um, a certain service is very expensive for the government to finance it, and the government gets its money from taxpayers all over across the population. So even poor people, they pay taxes. So expensive that you say, okay, let's have a fee. Let's have some contribution from the families themselves so that the bill for the government and the taxpayer is not that high, right? And if the fee leads to the exclusion of poorer groups, you say, okay, let's have a means-tested fee. Let's make it a little bit cheaper for the poorer groups or maybe even free. But what you see in the fee system of kindergartens in Bosnia-Herzegovina, but in the whole, the whole region, is that the fee isn't really that a very big percentage. The unit costs are so high that even though that's equivalent of maybe 25 euros, doesn't make a big difference for the state. The only function that it has is that it keeps the poorest groups away because those 25 euros are much too expensive for those poor people. So it's a very unfair system. And finally, there are so many no-job families in Bosnia-Herzegovina, okay, good, thank you, that there's no rationale for the government to subsidize the two-job families. Let me explain this. If a country has full employment, every family has at least one job. Some families have two jobs. But then the econo economy is growing and it's impeding growth. You need more people for the labor market. That's when you say, okay, 
the government should subsidize full daycare. But that is not the case in Bosnia Herzegovina. So many people have no job. So these are the unit costs of full day kindergarten as a percentage of average income. You see that especially in the, I'm sorry I didn't have this for Bosnia and Herzegovina, but if you look at the two former Yugoslav republics, Kosovo and Macedonia, it's extremely high. In Kosovo, 70%. So this means that the cost of having one child for one year in kindergarten is 70% of what the average citizen of that country consumes in the whole year. And that country, this child has a bed in the kindergarten and at home. It gets meals in the kindergarten and at home. It's extremely unfair. Uh, for the OECD, as Deepa showed, it's 19%. So it would be a little bit at the uh, level of Kyrgyzstan, Poland. That is the normal level. Um, Sazaika, I mentioned a figure of 16,500 for the three years. If you divide that by per capita income of France, it is also in that range, 20%, 15% of per capita income. But you see Kosovo, Macedonia, really very high. The second program modality is the pre-primary year. It's a, it's a modality that you see in many countries in the region, um, Serbia, Macedonia, uh, not Macedonia, but uh, Kosovo. One year of pre school preparation before entry in primary school. It, uh, it is being expanded, but it sort of stagnates. The, uh, the, uh, the implementation, the legal framework is not yet elaborated, and it's not clear, and there's a lack of political will to really to make it happen. It's really very sad. Uh, three, the integrated early childhood development centers, <clears throat> they cater for a much larger age range from zero to 10 with the playgroups from three to six. Um, in Bosnia and Herzegovina, uh, there are only seven, if I'm not wrong, but some of their branches, um, but there are other countries in the wider region where this is really picking up. They include and integrate parental education. Actually, sometimes the parents are there with the children at the same time. So not only learn, do the children learn through playing and various approaches, but at the same time the parents observe so they can do the same thing at home. It's extremely cost effective because you basically turn the home into a kindergarten. And they integrate healthcare as a nurse, social protection, a person that can tell the parents uh, about their rights, their entitlements to social benefits. And it is proven that the combined impact of those services is bigger than the sum of the distinct impacts. Uh, these short programs, as you find in those integrated early childhood development centers, this is mentioned before by other speakers, are so much cheaper but equally effective. And in the last column, forget about the other columns, in the most, the one to the right-hand side, you see the, the ratio. So, for instance, in Poland, the, the half-day programs are almost four times cheaper than the full-time programs, the full-time kindergarten. In the biggest difference is found in Macedonia, 6.43%, uh, and that's very relevant for Bosnia, because why is it so high? Why is the difference so big? in Macedonia. In Macedonia you have the system where the children of four-year-olds come in the morning for two hours, then still in the morning the five-year-olds, and then the six-year-olds in the afternoon. Or it could be three, four, five, depends on when primary education starts. Um, but that means you have three groups in one day. So one facility, one teacher, one inventory, one uh, cleaner, whatever you need for three groups at the same time. So the cost per child goes down very, very much. Um, parental education, finally, is, is not very high on the agenda in uh, Bosnia Herzegovina. Um, it usually is a combination of home visiting and parental groups where, where you gather parents. It is essential for bridging the critical period from conception, not birth, conception, to, prime, to, to age three. You know, if, if the program started at age three, and this is really a broadly accepted idea, at th three is the age that children need to start engaging in play in groups. But before that, what do you do? Parental education is what covers it. And now in most countries of the region, um, it could, emphasize, could build on existing services in the health sector, but I'm a little bit hesitant. Um, for instance, um, in Macedonia, there's the patronized system, 
maybe a similar exists in Bosnia and Herzegovina. It is not really functioning very well in Kosovo. That system, uh, you know, of, of home visiting nurses. Uh, was replaced by something that never functioned, so people have nothing there. In Romania, it has a bad name because of the Ceausescu era, era. Uh, but it could be a way. It, th there are countries outside the region, especially Pakistan, where the so-called lady health workers have been expanding their range of services to early stimulation, cognitive uh, development, which is a very successful approach. So now I'll go back to that scenario. And it maybe it's a little bit more uh, understandable. So in the present situation, you have those almost 10% of the children on the higher end of the social spectrum in the kindergarten. It is very expensive, and the returns are not that high. Emilia, in the beginning, she told about the returns on education, about Heckman, etc. Uh, you know, five times, seven times, every X amount of money is being uh, returned, uh, 17 times. Uh, yes, but it really depends on where you do it on the social spectrum. Come on, if you do it, if you put so much money to the high end of the social spectrum, you get no returns. Because those children, if they would not be in that kindergarten, they would be at home. They would be in a wonderful home learning environment with the toys, with a high education parent, a highly educated parent, with uh, books, with a rich vocabulary. Those are not the kids who drop out. They don't repeat grades. They don't, usually not the ones who become criminal. That's the risk on the other side. So economically, it's not a very wise investment to put so much money on the left-hand side. This is why you see so many colors on the right-hand side, right? So you see the UNICEF blue, the, the, the ICD centers, uh, which in this perspective has been expanded to 20%. Uh, you see that the, the pre-primary year is somewhat in the middle. In the ideal world, this is universalized for all the children who are not in kindergarten, not in those centers. There is at least a pre-primary year, and the children who are in those centers in the kindergarten, in the, that program is, is integrated in their, in their facility, of course. And then you see the green. Now, the green is, has shades. I've tried to express a little bit that um, the parenting programs have different intensity. For instance, you can start at, at age, at, sorry, at around birth, before birth, right after birth, perinatal period. You could imagine that there is uh, a two-weekly home visit and a weekly uh, and a monthly uh, uh, parent group where people gather. But you can imagine at the same time that uh, after two years, it doesn't have to be that frequent. Right? It, you focus on the critical period. This is expressed a little bit by the fact that you see more darker green at the low end, at the early ages, and it sort of fades away a little bit. And uh, as Deepa said, you start with the poorest. So it's a high intensity and, and at the high end. But um, here's another scenario. This is a boldly pro-poor. I've, I've tried to get them nicknames, those scenarios. Here we say, let's privatize the kindergarten. It, all, it already functions as a private system, right? These are the rich people, let's let them pay the full price and use that money to expand the integrated early childhood development centers much more. So it is much more fair. It's fairer, social justice, but it's also for the economy much better because you're putting your money where the highest returns are. It's a child rights approach, but also a very hard economic approach. This is one, I don't like it, but I, list, I should give you all, all the options. And these are just a few of a thousand options. I call this the school readiness focus. Here is no, not one pri primary year, but two. So here is a government that says we focus on school readiness. This is really our, our attention. Still allows children in, 10% of the children in the kindergarten. The integrated approach has not expanded very much and there's some parental education. Actually, this is the, the system in my country, Holland. We get two years uh, of toddler school integrated in the school because we tend to think that school readiness is the only thing. <laughs> anyway, and this is the last, this is the ideal world where you universalize um, access to, to kindergarten or the centers, whatever, the two, each of the two, from the age of three. All kids from the age of three are in a program. You still have the parental education. Uh, below the age of three, Kindergarten is privatized. 
from age three and four and five, there is still, uh, it, it still exists. I mean, if I say privatize, it does not mean that it goes away. It's just that the state is not lo no longer seeing that as the priority. I see it, it, these, all of those scenarios are highly politically sensitive. All I wanted to do is to, to show some variation. And I'd like to announce before the next slide that at the beginning of my speech, I mentioned this work by Innova, the, the Bosnian company, right? Now, if they've done their work after a number of months, it should be possible to put a figure on each of these cells. Uh, basically, this is a spreadsheet. It's done as Excel spreadsheet, so it doesn't show, but you could put uh, an amount of money in each of the cells. If you know the unit cost, what it cost to have one child in one of those programs in one year, and of course the unit costs differ per program, and you know how many kids there are, you multiply and you see the price tags. And you can add it up and you see for each scenario that you can come up with how much it would really cost. And then you can think about how do you divide the costs over parents, communities, cantons, whatever. Four strategies for scale-up. Uh, the first point has already been made. Uh, the second point, the demographic dividend. This is the demographic profile of Bosnia-Herzegovina. You see that uh, the biggest age group is the one in the middle. 45 to 50 years old, when they were born, that was the, the largest number of people that were ever born in, in, in Bosnia-Herzegovina. Then it went down, but very dramatically. You see this figure for many uh, countries in the region, but also Germany, low birth rates, but this is really extreme. It means two things. The number of kids f in the pre-primary age range is getting smaller and smaller. That's good news. Well, it's bad news for a lot of reasons, but for financing, it's good news. Also, the children moving out of the education system is, is large. I mean, a lot of primary schools and then secondary schools are getting smaller and smaller. Now, if you are creative, you can gain a lot of money from that. The education budget, there are possible gains from the education budget. Uh, you can think of, of creative solutions by creating smaller classrooms, uh, multi-grade teaching, and save a lot of money. And the spaces that you can free up in primary schools can be used for kindergartens or half-day programs. The teachers that are at risk of being unemployed, some of them can be retrained to work in pre-primary classes or uh, integrated ECD centers. Do not underestimate the retraining. Not anybody can do it, but it's possible. Uh, this one I skip for times reasons. Uh, this one I skip as well because it's too complicated. And this is the one, my last slide, the one that uh, Deepa didn't want to talk about. <laughs> and thank you very much for that. This shows uh, vertically per capita income. So poor countries, if I may say so, to the left hand side, richer countries to the right hand side, and then enrollment in preschool, very low to very high. Now the line goes up as you would expect. So you would say, okay, the richer the country, the higher enrollment. But you see really that there are two subgroups. There's a little circle of countries to the right-hand side. It's Poland, Hungary, the Baltic states. It's a really different group. If you would think away, if you just, just concentrate on that left half of the figure, you see there's hardly any correlation. Look at the green dots on the, bottom, on the top. That's Moldova, Belarus, Ukraine. These are countries poorer than Bosnia. Bosnia is the red dot, sorry, that's the red one. They're just as poor as, a Bos as, as Bosnia, but their enrollment is just as high as Poland and Czech, Czech Republic and, and, and Hungary. So it can be done. The reason for that is that basically uh, early childhood services are delivered by people. And if a country has a low average income, then on the one hand it has a little to spend, but on the other hand the salaries of teachers, of nurses, are low as well. So at the end of the day, it makes no difference. This is why it is possible for poor countries to have just, just as many people and children enrolled as the richer countries. Thank you very much.